Thank you, Dr. Corver. Our next presenter is Dr. Keith Bramwell. Dr. Bramwell grew up passionate about raising exhibition chickens as a hobby and then turned this interest into a career in the poultry industry. He received his Master of Science and PhD degrees at the University of Georgia, then filled a research training position at Colorado State University. He then spent over 20 years as a professor in poultry science at both the University of Georgia and the University of Arkansas. He currently is a technical consultant and manager of the consultant team at James White Incubator Company. Thank you. Do we have a clicker here or is this a hand operated operation here? I guess it's hand. Um, okay, first of all, I'm, I'm, uh, I guess when I was invited to come here, it was like, oh, going to a university. University of Guelph, having spent a long time in the academic side of the world, I was, I guess, expecting a little bit younger audience. I thought you all would be like the current students here, but it's never too late to continue to learn, correct? Um, so yeah, um, you're all a little bit older than I thought, so. Maybe I'm older, I'm not sure. That's probably it too. Um, the snow kind of surprised me this morning. Last week I was in California with customers and I guess it serves me right. We woke up one morning, went to the hatchery and it was about 10 degrees Celsius. And my colleague and I thought it was great. And he came bundled in a coat. I mean, he was in a coat holding his hot coffee to stay warm. And he said, it is absolutely freezing here. And we're like, what are you talking about? So I come up here standing in my coat because you know what? It's a little cold up here, colder than where I came from. So um, anyway, I'm going to talk about um, development of the avian embryo a little bit. Um, it's kind of hard to squeeze this topic in um, a 20-minute time slot. This really can be an entire semester course of avian um, development. So I'm going to try and hit some high points of what we look for, what's going on, what's important with avian development. and and kind of how it relates to our industry and what we do in our industry and in trying to manage this. You know, this egg right here serves a couple of purposes. If any of you had one of these for breakfast, a lot of people associate this with a, a food item. We have albumin, shell membrane, yolk, and the shell. Each of these perform a function not necessarily for breakfast, but a function for an embryo development. I always think it's really amazing to look at the components of this egg that could be breakfast, look at all the other components that make up that egg, and under the right conditions and circumstances for a chicken in a 21-day period, we get a chick. I mean, amazing to think about. From an, from an incubation standpoint, what it tells us is, is that egg is the, has the optimum environment for growth and development. And we hope that growth and development is an embryo. When we talk about our incubation, our hatcheries, that can also be contaminants. They will grow easily in that. Um, so we have to consider that when we, talk, when we look at our eggs and our incubation, our growth and development. I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, just briefly, about our um, embryo development. It's like building a house, okay? Um, I, before, you know, I started in school, took a few years off before I went, went to school, I worked construction, hung sheetrock, the gypsum board on the side of houses. And when we went into a place, we're like, we had a job. We're going to go in and we're going to throw up this, this sheetrock. Before we do that, the foundation better be right, the walls better be square, the electricians better have their job done, and so on and so on and so on, because once we hit that point of construction of that house, we can't go back to add something else. It's the same with the embryo. There is a series of events that, that must occur, and they have to occur in a certain order. Sometimes we have to control that. You know, we can see areas in the poultry industry, many areas, particularly in the broilers, where we control a lot of growth and development. Can we get breeders to lay coming egg production sooner than 21 weeks? 
course we can. Why don't we? Because we won't get the quality performance from the breeders. So we have to slow them down, follow a certain growth curve, allow development of that breeder hand to occur in a systematic way to get the quality we want. A broiler, a lot of our broilers now, different parts, are on a, scent, a, a type of feed restriction, meaning there's a lighting program to slow down growth at certain times of development to allow that broiler to form like it should. So an embryo, heard a little while ago, the projections that in you know, 15 years or so, we take a chick right from the egg to the processing plant. You know, I've heard this for 20 years, the jokes about this. Oh yeah, we can do that. We can actually hatch an embryo sooner than 21 days. That's always surprised me. Why have we taken a 60 day growth curve in a broiler and cut it down to 45 days or whatever, depending on the size, yet the incubation is still 21 days? Because that's what's necessary to allow that embryo to grow and develop in the order and pattern that it, that it needs to, right? We can't force things, we can't push things because that embryo, that's our future, that's our broiler. Okay, a little discussion about the, the feeding and the precocial and altricial chicks. Altricial chicks, songbirds, precocial chicks are chickens, turkeys, ducks. You know, there's a certain amount of development that occurs before they hatch. All those things need to continue to occur in the proper time frame, can't really push things, we often affect the performance of the bird, okay? So it's like building a house. There's an order, there's a system with what's going on, and then we are responsible from an from a, um, incubation standpoint in our industry is to take upon ourselves what the hen would do and then control that and provide the embryo with what it needs. Going to the initial start of that embryo starts with insemination whether it's artificial insemination natural insemination then there's a series of events that occur uh, mostly within the hen the hen stores sperm this is a function that has to happen in our avian species the sperm has to be transported to the site of fertilization has to recognize binding sites on the on the on membrane undergo an acrosome reaction and then gain access to the genetic material of the female to fertilize the egg. Once fertilization occurs, all these events have to occur in that order to, to get our fertilization. When does this occur? Um, it occurs within minutes after ovulation. A hen goes in a nest, lays an egg, and 20 minutes later, done a lot of research on this, it's not 25 minutes and it's not 15 minutes, it is 20 minutes. She will ovulate the egg to be laid the next day. And within minutes of that, some of the old literature will say within 15 to 20 minutes um, fertilization occurs. It's actually less than five minutes fertilization occurs because as soon as that yolk is ovulated and the oviduct encapsulates it in the infundibulum, starts pulling it in and that happens uh, basically immediately Albumin is starting to be deposited on that yolk and the fertilization process stops. There's an inhibitor in that albumin. So it has to happen immediately within minutes. So then we have a fertilized egg that then is transported down um, the oviduct. Takes 24, 26 hours to complete formation of that shell, typically. Um, body temperature of the hen <coughs> is sufficient in that we have um, embryo growth and development may have up to 20, 40, even 60,000 cells of that laid egg. So when I taught at the university, you know, we try and have trick questions. No, we would never do that. But um, what is the incubation time from the time of fertilization to hatch of an egg? Most people say, "Oh, it's 21 days." It's actually 22 days because you have a day in the hen. We control it after that. So it takes 22 days from fertilization to hatch. <coughs> Just like the other question I would ask, how long does it take to grow a broiler? Depends on your market size, all this stuff. Most people will count the time we put it in the house till the time it's processed. So let's say that's six weeks. It's actually nine weeks. Three of those weeks are in the egg. And that's a continuous process. There's a lot of things that can happen in our um, handling of eggs, clear up to 
frequency of mating, length of egg storage, um, conditions in egg storage that will have an effect on broiler performance. I'm not presenting the research today, but we've seen that. So you stress that embryo anytime in embryo development or as a newly hatched chick going out to the barn, you stress that any time in there, it will affect performance. The embryo is no different. Okay? I always like to look at the, the um, thought as like, okay, if we have a stressor that causes a mortality in a chick or in an embryo, say we lose 5% of the embryos, does that mean the other 95% were not stressed? No, it just means the other 95% didn't die. Most of them were also stressed, which will affect performance. So we have a laid egg, a fertilized egg with an embryo um, growing at the time of lay. Um, <clears throat> talked about the um, fertilization process occurring right at the time of ovulation. In, in birds, not just birds, bats and some different things that do this as well, the, the female has the ability to store sperm. And that actually plays a function, an important function in our industry, is we have to have access to, to sperm immediately after ovulation. So the hens, when they're mated, they can store sperm for, you know, we hear a lot of different things in my experience. You get out about three weeks, 20, 21, 22 days. The incidence of fertile eggs after that is minimal in chickens. But the quality of the embryo is certainly affected. We start getting fertile eggs from hens that haven't been mated in two weeks. Those that are fertile will produce a less viable embryo. So we often see that with a correlation with reduced fertility in older flocks due to infrequent mating. We see higher early embryo mortality because it's a less viable sperm, it's a less viable embryo. We typically will see those not do as well either because once again, there's old sperm Less viable sperm, less viable embryo, effects of embryo performance and the broiler performance. So the hens have the ability to store sperm. How we manage the hens not getting into this will affect the ability to store that sperm to provide um, sperm cells to the site of fertilization immediately. Sperm then undergoes set an acrosome reaction. Um, enzymes are released. They digest a hole in, in that germinal disc area. Did a lot of research on this over the years of um, evaluating performance of breeders, <coughs> turkeys, chickens, even quail, on the, the ability of the sperm to interact with the egg and it was fertilization. And of course this fertilization occurs at the germinal disc. So we have a laid egg that's fertile. We can often see this in unincubated eggs. Okay, the, the picture on the left, hopefully you can see it okay, it's more of a tight, compact germinal disc area. Or on the right, it's kind of like a little donut, a ring. That's our cellular development. That picture on the right, the size of that can be greatly influenced and impacted on how we handle the eggs. For instance, in other countries where they don't handle eggs as closely as we have, they don't have cooling systems on the farm, they don't have uh, cool trucks to haul eggs to the hatchery. We might go and see eggs off the farm that would have a germinal disc area the size of a, a dime or even a nickel. Pretty good size because there's a lot of pre-incubation and, and development. So our storage is trying to control that because we want them all about the same when they sit in the incubators. Can we use unfertilized eggs to get an accurate assessment of fertility? Not really. I mean, we can get a ballpark idea, but we need more precision. So if you give me 100 eggs, I'll look at those and 95 of those 100 eggs, I can be pretty certain what they are. There's that 5% that are kind of in between a little bit. That's too important to us to actually use this to really get a fertility assessment. So we typically look a little bit later at development. 12 hours of development, we start seeing that germinal just grow. And at 24 hours, we start seeing that grow. Now look at how this is growing from that side of fertilization we will see that embryo begin to grow and, and envelop that entire yolk. So when we're doing an embryo diagnosis or an embryo breakout, we're looking for, to see if the egg is fertile, some organized development. 
We don't want to look at a little meat spot or blood spot somewhere else on the yolk. Oh, that must be a chick. No, is it developing like this? Because that's what needs to happen. We take that, that avian development begins the initial fertilization and eventually um, grows and develops into a newly hatched chick. So basics of incubation, how we control embryo development. Temperature, is this, this applies to all incubators. James Way or competitors or whatever. We're trying to all do the same thing. We're applying temperature, we can control embryo growth rate. We can make it faster or slower. Can we speed that up, the incubation process up? Yes, we can. Does it affect chick quality? Absolutely, so we don't want to do it. So we use this to control development, to let the developmental processes occur as they should. <coughs> Humidity in our machines controls our moisture loss. Do we need some moisture loss? Yes. We have too much, detrimental. We don't have enough, detrimental. So we're controlling that again to allow the embryo to grow. Basically what we're trying to do is mimic what the mother hen does without all the tools and equipment and technology we have. She just does it. Ventilation, I'm machine, gas exchange, temperature and moisture exchange, the correlation with all this. We have to have the right um, ventilation and air movement in addition to the right temperature and humidity. We can't have too much air movement because we won't get the gas exchange. We can't have too little because we won't get uniform gas exchange. So there's a correlation, they, they all work together. And then turning allows the freedom of embryo movement. So what's really happening with our embryos and kind of putting it in a bigger scale to kind of lump it right together, break it up into a couple phases. We have essentially the first half of incubation, up to 12 days, um, more so early on in that 12 day period, we have a time of differentiation. What is differentiation? It's a time where, in simple terms, the cells are going where they need to go to be what they need to be. Is that pretty simple? And that, your brain, your kidney, your gut, your eye. So these are being partitioned out during these first 12 days. From that point on, 13 days, then we have um, the growth phase. Now the embryo is growing and filling up that egg, and that's when our heat production occurs. So we have our growth phase um, after that. So real quickly through the embryo itself. Starts off the size of a pinhead. We've talked about some of this. Very small, starts to grow. Some of the membranes that are associated with that, the yolk sac, accompanying vitamin um, circulatory system, secretes enzymes to change the yolk contents into a soluble form for absorption. These things have to occur right. You know, at this time of differentiation, if things don't occur right, the embryo dies. You know what's really interesting is that that time of differentiation, particularly in that two to three to four day period where we see a spike in embryo mortality, that's about the same time when differentiation is occurring in some of our mammalian species when we see um, fetuses aborted, miscarriages. Those don't happen right we're gonna stop growth and development and we're gonna, we're gonna abort. Well, the chicken, it doesn't, you can't get rid of it, it just dies. It's just, but that's when it's occurring. So we have some of this mortality loss is, is normal. We're gonna to have to have it because it's a biological system. The amnion filled, the fluid filled sac which surrounds the embryo. Um, it's a transparent fluid, embryo floats to protect the embryo from shocks, helps parts kind of um, from adhering to each other. Allantois, um, developing through three to 10 days, functions for respiratory, expiratory, and digestive systems. So these things are all incredibly important. These things are occurring very early. So we're laying the foundation for a quality chick early on. How we manage these embryos is, is obviously important. The serosa or chorion lies close to the shelf, uses the allantois and that performs a very important function from there on out. Oxygenation of the blood, carbon dioxide removal from the blood. Um, if that's not developed correctly, um, we can have loss. Okay, real quickly, kind of run out of time, I think. Day one of incubation. We will have some visible tissue development in an organized manner. That's pretty much that donut ring, but there's a lot going on below that. Some of the germ layers from the streak occurring. Um, we don't see most of that but it is important 
Day two, start really having differentiation of the parts of the embryo, the brain, eye, ear, gut. Um, we'll start to see some blood formation. Um, day three, see a little bit bigger embryo. Um, heart starts to position itself a little bit. Day four, the eye becomes pigmented, and this is not an embryo diagnosis talk, but this is an important factor if we're trying to evaluate our embryo um, development, knowing certain key points of development helps us determine when our losses occur. This is one of them. At day four, we should have a very well pigmented eye. So we have an embryo loss with no eye pigment, it occurred in that first three days. And again, that can tell us some things. Day six, starts to take a little, a little bit of a bird shape. Sex is determined for the most part. Day eight, egg tooth is present, distinct. Um, that's important for the hatching process. And again, that's one of the criteria we use in doing our embryo diagnosis. Day nine, um, skulls forming, a little bit bigger. Day 12, day 15, pretty much covered and down. One of the things I look for in looking at embryo development is the chick completely covered and down and very prominent. They are, they hit that day 15 point in time. Day 18, um, they're ready to begin hatching. And by day 19, they start to really pull in all of that yolk material. Um, pulmonary respiration is initiated at this point. This is another time period where we could have embryo loss. The embryo pips into the air cell. There's a higher incidence of CO2 in that air cell. And it kind of the stimulus, we gotta get out of here. So they pip in the air cell, shortly after that they'll pip through the shell, and that's when they start taking their first breath and the pulmonary respiration starts. If that doesn't switch over, we get mortality. We will see mortality at this point in time. Because again, it's a biological system and sometimes we don't get a switch like we should. Um, and we look for the hatch chick. So just finishing up real quick, um, the, the points that we will typically see mortality Two to three days during the times of cell differentiation. These are normal mortality patterns. About 18, 19 days when the embryo is supposed to switch to pulmonary respiration if this does not occur, we can have losses. And then hatch problems that might be associated with malposition or um, our incubation environment it is not conducive to um, them hatching and the moisture loss associated with it. So real, that was a real quick rundown on embryo development. Um, there's a lot to it. Um, with that, I will um, entertain any questions that we have any now, or I'll be here for the panel as well. So, if you have time for the panel, we will yep. try and hold questions so we yep. can get back on track. I will. Thank you, Dr. Right. Bernal.